The Roundtable joined by Chris Christie, Donna Brazil, the USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page. Welcome to you. And our Chief Washington Correspondent, John Carl, fresh off the Washington Correspondents Dinner last night down in D.C. And I do want to talk about Kevin McCarthy, Chris, but let's begin uh, with our new poll that I reported on at the beginning uh, of the program. President Biden's approval rating up a tick. Democrats doing a little bit better in the generic uh, race for the congressional midterms, but still facing huge challenges, especially inflation. Well, George, I think that the two most important domestic issues right now are inflation and crime. And those are where the Democrats are, and the president in particular, is way upside down. And so unless he can move those numbers significantly between now and November, it, it bodes really poorly for them. You know, we know that the Republicans are going to gain, on average, 27 seats. They're the out-of-power party for the last 60 years. Those kind of numbers that we see in inflation and crime are the things that could take that from 27 to 40. And, and that's really what we're talking about now. The Republicans are going to take the House. The question is, how large is the win going to be? And will it help them to sweep some governors and, and senators in as well? Well, Don, as I said, there has been some improvement for the Democrats in the last couple of months. What do they need to do to add to that? Well, first of all, stop worrying about the polls today because we have 192 days. And if Democrats are not focused uh, on voters and taking care of them and making sure that people understand what Democrats are up to. Look, Republicans still have an uphill battle. They are running candidates. Uphill to battle for Republicans? They still have primaries, George, where they, they're deciding they want a far-right, radical candidate who has taken an oath of loyalty to the former president versus an oath to the Constitution. Voter, voters want real results. They don't just want to see Republicans uh, run because Trump said, you got to go out there and tell the big lie. They want to see candidates who are going to tackle inflation like Democrats. They want to see candidates who are tackling crime like Democrats tackling student debt forgiveness like Democrats, lowering insulin prices like Democrats. That's what voters want to see. But I think a lot depends on what happens in these primaries starting this Tuesday. Well, well, George, 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 one second, though. I have to. I mean, that's Donna's wish list. But let's look at Georgia, clearly the most important state in this country for both parties right now politically. New poll out this week. Governor Kemp is beating the Trump acolyte David Perdue by 28 points. He may avoid a runoff altogether. Um, and so we're not seeing the things that Donna's wishing for across the country. In fact, four Republican governors are being primaried. I will promise you that all four of those Republican governors are going to beat the Trump challenger. And so we're not seeing that same fight. We're, we're united on inflation and crime and not on the things that Donna's talking Susan, about. Susan, one place you are seeing it, state of Ohio, that primary comes up. On Tuesday, J.D. Vance, the president, former president's handpicked candidate, appears to have lead, but it's a close race. It's a, it's a, they're clustered together, but Vance was not even in the, in the top rank when he got the endorsement of Donald Trump, the surprise endorsement in some ways, since, since he had been very critical of Trump in the past. Uh, and now he narrowly leads uh, the field. If J.D. Vance wins that primary, he'll have Donald Trump to thank, and it will be sign of Trump's continued influence in the Republican Party. John Carl, what are you making of the poll? Well, it looked, you know, certainly improvement for Joe Biden, but he is all he is headed towards a, a, a potentially disastrous midterm election. If you look at his overall approval rating, George, it is roughly where uh, Barack Obama was uh, in, going into the 2010 election, which obviously was a huge Republican uh, wave. And it's not far off of where Bill Clinton was uh, going into the 1994 election, also a big Republican wave. Uh, some improvement. I think the important point on Ohio, by the way, is you will see a split decision in Ohio. Uh, you have a governor's race, uh, Mike DeWine, who has been, uh, who has stood up to Donald Trump, who Donald Trump has attacked relentlessly, didn't go so far to his endorse his opponent, opponent, but made it clear he wasn't with Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine is likely to win. But whoever wins that Senate primary, George, it's going to be a Trump Republican. J.D. Vance may, uh, you know, pull it off with this uh, help from a Trump endorsement. But if he doesn't win, the candidate who will win, perhaps Josh Mandel, who's in second in that poll, uh, is, is, is campaigning by saying he's more pro-Trump than the guy that was endorsed by Trump. So split decision in Ohio. I don't think we're going to know, uh, you know, Trump's pull on the party uh, until the end of this primary season. Okay, let's just switch gears, talk about Kevin McCarthy, uh, Chris Christie. I have to admit, I was surprised. I mean, Kevin McCarthy caught lying about what he said about Donald Trump and his own Republican colleagues 
on tape in that book, book by uh, Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns, yet seems to have come out of it about as strong as ever. Well, look, I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, you know, as I've said previously, I can't stop being a former prosecutor when I hear about stuff like this and we're talking about tapes. It brings me back to that part of my, of my career. And I listen to the tape rather than watch the read the coverage, George. He gets asked about the 25th Amendment by Liz Cheney. And when you listen to that tape, he's walking him, his way through. Here are all the different possibilities of what could happen. What he said was, if the Senate has the votes to, to convict, then I would recommend to him that he resign. It's the same advice that was given to, to uh, President Nixon by Barry Goldwater. He, he didn't say I was telling him to hey, resign hey, uh, George, if he has the votes. And, and so I, I think it's a much different... It's a much different thing than what he's being characterized. It's not good. And listen, Kevin was angry. There's no doubt that Kevin's angry at the president then, and he made that really clear. But I don't think he ever told the president he should resign. But he also, but, Donna, talked about having some of his own members taken off Twitter. That's true. And look, let me just say, Jonathan Call Me has some more news. Jonathan, uh, uh, I believe there, there, there's more audio. We know that Kevin McCarthy essentially said that he was going to confront the king, but when he got there, he melted like butter on a hot skillet. He was afraid to even talk to the president about the wrongs that he had done. So, look, the, it's on audio, and while Speaker Pelosi is in Ukraine, meeting with Zelensky, Kevin McCarthy is behind back doors trying to reassure his caucus that he's not trying to take him off of Twitter and Facebook. But Mc McCarthy is benefiting from the fact that the working assumption in Washington is that Republicans will take the House. Kevin McCarthy likely to be elected as a speaker. Republicans have their eye on that prize, and they are willing to overlook little offenses like making this tape that's very critical of Trump and of some of his own members, and also, uh, and li then lying yeah, about it in public. a little offense, and, I, okay, you, and Chris gave a good explanation of what he actually said on tape, but then to come out and just act like he didn't say what he said, isn't that a bigger problem? And, and for members of Congress to say, well, maybe, maybe it was deceptively edited, no evidence no. that that was the case. Maybe it's, it's from the New York Times. They're the hub of fake news. It is willing to adopt some of the strategies that President Trump adopted when you have unpleasant news to just deny it, to say it's false, even if it's true, and to survive. And that is the path Kevin McCarthy is on. You know, if, if, the very, if there's, for some reason, a narrow Republican majority in the House, maybe this rebounds to, to create some problems for Kevin McCarthy, but it sure hasn't happened yet. John, that's the question I want to ask you. Do you believe his hold on the speakership, assuming the Republicans do gain seats in the midterms, is as strong as it appears today? Uh, I, I think we, do, we don't know, George. The, the, the honest answer is, is we don't know. The Republicans are united going into the midterm elections. The, uni the Republicans uh, want to win the House. McCarthy will be the leader that takes them through the midterm elections. But what happens after, uh, when, they, when they come together uh, to elect a speaker in January, uh, all Donald Trump has to do is to come out solidly against McCarthy and all bets are off. McCarthy uh, is, it's like a blackmail where everybody knows the blackmail material because it's been out for the world to see. Uh, Donald Trump knows that, uh, that McCarthy has to uh, have, uh, you know, that, that, that he has basically control over McCarthy's future. But I have to say, uh, with all due respect, Governor Christie, I don't think you're characterizing what was on that tape accurately. There's no way to listen to that tape and to think that Kevin McCarthy told the truth. That tape, uh, you, you hear Kevin McCarthy saying, I've had it with that guy, refer referring right. to Donald Trump. Yep. You, hear, now, look, uh, you hear Kevin McCarthy saying he is going to call Donald Trump and his recommendation would be that he uh, is to not, resign. It is true. And, and that's the thing not what is, he said. But, but, but it, the, it, John, it, look, uh, look, John, that's not what, what he said. Can, can I please... That's not what he said. Can, can I please finish? Walking it, through... No, no, but look, I've heard your point. He, he, he didn't what he, say what, what he you said. said was, but yes, he did. He, no. What he said was, if the Senate has the votes to convict, that's not a quote. I would that's not a quote. That, that's not a quote from the tape. That's then I would tell tape. him to resign. That's what the conversation was. And look, you know who cares about this? Uh, you know, maybe five people in Washington D.C. Uh, the, the voters across the country could care less about this. This is the rearview mirror stuff that the American people don't care about when they're paying $5 a gallon for gas, when they've got 8.5% inflation and can't buy their groceries, and when there's crime all over the streets in our major cities. They just don't care, John. And that's why the story doesn't get any traction outside Washington, D.C. But, but, but the point is that there is a credibility issue here, Chris, because 
These reporters, Jonathan Martin and, and, and Burns, they reported what McCarthy said. And it wasn't just about saying that he was going to call him and suggest he resigns. It, it was the whole, whole, the whole gamut here, the stuff about Twitter, the tough, the, the, where, where he said, I've had it with this guy. And McCarthy comes out and issues a flat denial. This is fake news. They've made it up. It's not true. And then you have the tapes. Every quote in that original story is backed up by the tape, every single quote. And McCarthy has come to the world and said, it was all fake news, it's not true. Now maybe, maybe you think that doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter politically, but there is a question of credibility. The denial was not accurate. The denial was in fact a lie. It didn't, certainly didn't seem to matter to most House Republicans. Not yet, and maybe never. Um, and uh, that reflects, you know, there's all kinds of things happening in Washington now based on the assumption of what's going to happen in the midterms. That is shaping everything. It's shaping fractures in the Democratic Party uh, between moderates and progressives about what to do about student loans, uh, what to do about uh, immigration at the border. Uh, and you see it in the calculation of so many Democrats, a couple dozen Democrats to decide not to run again uh, for their House seats. Uh, and you see it reflected in the calculations about uh, Republicans measuring the drapes. You also Washington. see it down in Brazil, and a lot of Democrats, including the White House, getting prepared for the possibility that several cabinet members yes. could be impeached if the House Republicans take over, maybe even President Biden. This is why we can't just say uh, the American people are not interested in looking in a rearview mirror. I think they are looking ahead. And this is really about an opportunity to have a political party that is tackling these big issues. Inflation is a big issue. I'm glad the feds are going to sit down uh, this week and decide what they can do to, to set a better table for us, because they, they were the ones sleeping at the switch, not Joe oh. Biden. So I, I do believe that the American people care about the future and that Democrats are going to continue to debate these critical issues because we know that at the end of the day, it's about what you're planning to do for us tomorrow. You know, we only have about a minute left. John, before we go, I know you were at the White House Correspondents' Center last night. You received that award for reporting under deadline pressure. First White House Correspondents' Center in two years, first one with the president since 2016. Just give us uh, your impressions. I know that Trevor Noah's first joke was that this could be the biggest super spreader event <laughs> in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I, look, th th that definitely hung over it. Uh, but I have to say it was great to, to see the White House Correspondents' Dinner come back. It was great to see a president back at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, uh, to see journalism honored. And there was a seriousness to this uh, this time because we have seen uh, democracy under attack. We've seen the idea of a free press under attack. And I thought the most moving and important part of the dinner, George, actually was the tribute to the journalists who lost their lives in Ukraine. Uh, very moving tribute. Uh, you saw Austin Tice's family there, who has been uh, a captive in Syria since 2012. Uh, it was a reminder that, that journalism uh, is important work, and it's a work uh, that, that has come under assault, both here in the United States and, of course, around the world. Boy, it certainly is, and I'm so, I certainly hope that everybody who uh, went to the dinner last night comes out healthy. Yeah. John, congratulations on your award. Thanks to all of you for your time this morning. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.